let us uh, get started with uh, module uh, um, 1 segment 4. So, we are going to continue our discussion of uh, verifying matrix multiplication. Uh, we saw an algorithm in the previous segment and today what we are going to do is just prove that that algorithm is correct and the sum uh, definition of correct. So, we will have to redefine the notion of correctness uh, for randomized algorithms just a little bit at least some types of randomized algorithms. And uh, uh, so, along the way we would be introducing a few things principle of deferred decisions, uh, the law of total probability. So, these two principles we will um, discuss them as we go along and then we will give a formal proof of correctness and uh, initial proof of correctness will be a probabilistic um, statement. So, it will come with certain probabilistic guarantees. What we will do is then we will show how to boost the probability of uh, correctness to pretty much any extent that we want. Okay. So, that is the plan for today's uh, segment. Let us start with some bad news first hopefully to you know set ourselves uh, the stage to give some good news later. So, if you recall the algorithm uh, you chose a random vector r, you multiplied a b r on the left hand side and then right hand side we, mul uh, we multiplied c r and we checked if they were equal and if they were equal we reported a b was equal to c otherwise not. So, that is the algorithm and if you deterministically choose r you can always find an r for which the algorithm is going to be incorrect. So, an undergraduate algorithms course would not suffice to handle this uh, uh, problem because then you will immediately think about the worst case and in the worst case this algorithm is incorrect at least in the deterministic worst case sense. But then our hope lies in the fact that r is chosen uniformly at random. Uh, and each bit is independent of each other and so we are going to redefine the notion of correctness and uh, what we are going to do is prove the following statement that remember when you run the algorithm there are two outcomes uh, that in this case uh, our sample space is correct versus incorrect and we want to argue that the probability that the, the algorithm is incorrect is at most some delta um, okay, some uh, delta and in this case we will start with delta being just a half. So, to begin with half uh, the only guarantee we give is that half the time our algorithm will be um, correct, but the other half possibly could be wrong and then we will see how what we can do later uh, with this. Okay. So, um, so uh, let us look at it a little bit carefully when a b is equal to c. Okay our algorithm will never be incorrect. Why is that? Because whatever r you choose a b times r will equal c times r because a b and c are equal. So, uh, we are always going to be correct when a b equals to c. The only interesting part therefore, is when a b is not equal to c and our algorithm if it was correct should be able to say that a b is not equal to c. What we will have to ensure is that given that a b is not equal to c our algorithm will say incorrect with probability at most delta that is what we are trying to uh, prove. For the rest of this uh, we will be therefore, focusing on uh, a b not equal to c we will just assume that a b is not equal to c. Okay. Uh, now, we define uh, d equals uh, a b um, minus c and therefore, now we can think of d times r equals a b times r minus c times r. So, remember our algorithm is going to check if a b r is equal to c r. So, the other an equivalent check is to see whether d r is equal to uh, 0 and if it was if it shows up to be 0 it is incorrect. Why? Because we have made the assumption that a b is not equal to c and d r equal to 0 would be fooling us into thinking a b is equal to c. So, now uh, we want to uh, apply a principle called the principle of deferred decisions just a technique um, and in case you did not know deferred means delayed. Okay. Some decisions are going to be delayed and others are going to be uh, assumed to have happened. Okay. So, in this case why are we applying this principle of deferred decision? Um, we have to contend with r which is an n bit vector and what we are the way we are going to do that is we are going to fix all elements except one this one element we are going to choose and defer the decision on that element alone among this n elements and then uh, we will argue that will be the deferred element and then we will argue based on that deferred element 
that the probability is at of in being incorrect is at most a half. Okay. So, let us illustrate the principle of deferred decision first by a simpler um, setting. Okay. So, let us uh, uh, reorient ourselves to the simpler example, um, toss a coin 10 times, what is the probability that the number of heads is odd? This is the question at hand. Okay. So, here is one way we can do it. We know that there are 2 power 10 equally likely outcomes because there are uh, n uh, 10 um, uh, coin tosses. Out of them, how can we, how many outcomes have an odd number of heads? It is going to be 10 choose 1 plus 10 choose 3 plus 10 choose 5 and so on, right. So, the answer if you want to directly argue the answer for the number of uh, heads being odd is uh, you know you have all these uh, 10 choose uh, odd numbers and the uh, summation of them in the numerator and 2 raised to the 10 in the denominator and it is going to get a little messy to argue what this is. Okay. Uh, we are not going to bother about that, but let us see how the principle of deferred decisions works in this case. Okay. Now, what we are going to do is assume that the first 9 tosses have been completed and there are some L heads. We do not know what the that L value is, there are some L heads. Okay. So, now we are going to defer the decision for the last coin toss alone. Okay. And uh, if, you re, uh, if you think about it, the last one is equally likely to be heads or tails. Okay. And now, you can uh, see what happens. If L is even, okay, then how do we get an odd number of heads? Uh, then the last will be heads with probability a half. Even if on the other hand, if L is odd, again the last uh, coin toss will be a tails with probability half and in either case we are going to uh, be able to um, conclude at least intuitively at this point that the total number of heads is going to be odd with probability half. Okay. Embedded I mean this is just an intuition right now, we will need the law of total probability to formalize this. Okay, so, let us um, uh, get back to the uh, problem of matrix uh, verifying matrix multiplication. Okay, so, now let us look at uh, D and we claim uh, because remember a, B, uh, D equals A B minus C and we are going to assume that A B is not equal to C. So, there must be a non-zero entry and uh, we are just going to assume that that non-zero entry is, uh, is the very first one D 1 1. Okay. And uh, we are interested our remember the bad event that we are trying to show the probability of that bad event is uh, small is this D R equal to 0. So, when we say d r equals to 0, we can just apply the formula um, and uh, so, what we are going to uh, uh, do is work with the, the first row of d alone. Okay. So, so, this is uh, basically the first row of d multiplied with the uh, elements of r. Um, and uh, we want to ask how what is the probability that that entry will be a 0. Okay. And that uh, so, it is a if you think about it uh, this is going to be um, one way in which the bad event uh, one important requirement and a necessary condition for d r the, the matrix d times r to be equal to 0. Basically, this 0 is the first entry of d r. And we basically want to limit ourselves to proving that this itself uh, is uh, uh, will happen with uh, some bounded probability. Uh, so, now let us expand this uh, summation out. So, it is uh, basically what we are doing is just isolating the first term and remember we want to use the principle of deferred decision. So, we are isolating the first term which is the, one, the term that we are going to defer and the rest of the terms are here in the summation. And then we are going to we are isolating just this R 1. So, we get some formula. So, for now focus on the fact that we have isolated R 1. This is the first bit in our random vector R. So, now our, uh, uh, our statement can be re, uh, simplified as to show that the probability that the first uh, bit R 1 equals this particular right hand side quantity is at most a delta. Okay. 
So it's a slightly, uh, it seems messy, but what we have, the, the nice thing we have done is we have isolated our focus on just R1. So now we have the ability to apply the principle of deferred decision. So we do not, we kind of try to avoid the other uh, random bits, we focus our efforts on seeing what happens to R1. And so that is the principle of deferred decision we are going to try to apply, uh, but if you want to be careful and formal about it, what we are actually doing is going to apply now at this point the law of total probability which we will, I will talk about now. How does this law of total probability work? Now assume that there is uh, an, uh, this uh, omega is a sample space and within that this sample space is broken into E1, E2, E3, E4 and so on, these are mutually um, uh, disjoint uh, subsets of omega and when you take the union of all these E1, E2, E3 and so on, it should actually equal omega. So basically it is a partition of the sample space, okay, this Eis. Okay. And our interest is a particular um, event B, okay. that is the oval shown over here. And uh, what the law, law of total probability says that now you can compute the probability of B by looking at the intersections of B with the Eis. Okay, and that's a if you look at this picture, it's a very intuitive uh, thing to see, right? It's just uh, when you intersect B with E1, uh, you get that portion of the uh, sample space covered, right? And you just uh, Remember the axioms of probability theory, you just have to add up these individual intersections and you get the probability of the uh, event B. Okay. And now uh, if you recall the, uh, the formula for conditional probability, uh, what was that? Uh, if you uh, recall that, it is going to be probability of B given E i uh, is equal to probability of B intersected with E i divided by probability of E i. And now uh, uh, we um, uh, just take, uh, we um, ju jiggle the terms around to get it to be in this uh, form. This is essentially the law of uh, total probability. How are we going to apply it over here? And remember, uh, we are interested in. Um, uh, the uh, our bad event is dr equal to 0 and so that uh, what is that uh, probability? Now you can take this bad event dr equal to 0 and you can intersect it with a bunch of Eis. Okay. And if you can compute these individual intersection probabilities, you can just add them up. So that is the law of total probability and uh, what are the Eis that we are going to take? This is where we it connects to the principle of deferred decisions. The Eis are going to be the, I mean basically how many Eis are there? There are uh, 2 raised to the n minus 1 Eis. So I ranges from 0 to 2 to the uh, n minus 1. And it is the event that the rest of the random bits correspond to the binary number i. So the first uh, um, n, mi n minus 1 bits uh, or not the first one n minus 1, in this case the uh, bits r2 to rn um, can take on some binary value, right. Remember and we are, our intention is to not worry about any of them, okay. And if you think about it, the, the union of all of those events is going to be uh, the sample space and they are mutually disjoint because we are talking about different random bits. Uh, when they, when you evaluate them, they evaluate to different binary numbers. Okay, so now we can apply the principle of uh, deferred decision. So now what we are going to do is uh, apply the principle of deferred decision in this manner. So we are basically uh, now at this point um, uh, isolating our focus to R1 which we already showed we can do that. And uh, the thing remember the random bits were chosen independently. So the, the whether R1 equals to this quantity is going to be independent of uh, the uh, Eis because the Eis depend on the rest of the random bits. So we can simply um, because of that independence, we can convert this intersection into a multiplication and we will get it in this uh, form. Ah, the first inequality, let me be a little bit careful here. This uh, dr 
is the original bad event ok. That is the bad event that if you look at dr it is going to be a, a, a vector and it is going uh, every element has to be a 0. What we are going to do is focus only on the first element and argue that just the probability of the first and that is what is happening over here just the probability of the first element uh, being 0 itself we are going to uh, bound it. So, that is going to so this is going to be a stricter requirement this uh, dr equal to 0 for simplicity we are going to uh, bound. So, if you think about uh, the um, sample space. So, let us uh, draw the sample space dr the bad event dr equal to 0 is going to be something like this. So, this is the bad event dr equal to 0 ok. This will require all of them to be 0. What we are going to do is instead focus on a larger event which only requires the first element to be 0 ok and we are going to argue that this uh, this is the this is this event and we are going to argue that this outer uh, um, event itself is going to have small probability that is what we are doing. Does that make sense? So, if you look at each uh, let us look at E 1 ok. E 1 is going to be the event that if you take the random bits uh, R 2 uh, R 3 ok. So, if you look at R 2 R 3 and so on up to R n ok they can take values 0 or 1 and now they can take how many values uh, they can go to uh, go from 0 to 2 to the uh, n minus uh, 1 minus 1. These are all the possible ways that they can change ok and E 1 is the case where they take the value if you look at the binary thing they they should if you take this binary string where everything is 0 except the least significant bit that evaluates to a 1 right that is E 1. E, uh, E 0 will be when all the bits are 0. E 2 will be when all the bits uh, I mean the it will be something like uh, 1 0 and so on and that basically cover will cover the entire sample space and that is exactly what we wanted for the law of total probability. So, that will in, uh, cover the entire uh, sample space and we are taking uh, for each of the EIs we are intersecting it with this uh, e, uh, this event that we care about this outer uh, uh, yellow that is in the law of total probability figure that that is the B the oval B that we drew. So, now what we are going to do is just apply the formula the question is this how is this R 1 uh, equal to this uh, quantity well R 1 is a bit value either it is either 0 or 1 and clearly let me make this uh, why are these two events independent that is the question. So, if you look at the first event R 1 what we have assumed is that uh, we are working with the principle of deferred decision this right hand side has some quantity this right hand side has some quantity and whether R 1 is going to equal that quantity or not is going to be completely <coughs> independent of what other uh, random bit values are and that is why R 1 th this this uh, event is going to uh, operate independent of E i x. The outcome of this event is going to depend purely on R 1. In the principle of deferred decision we have at this point in time we have fixed this quantity that is the reason. So, now uh, what we are going to do is just uh, apply some values. So, uh, this R 1 how will it equal this uh, quantity on the right hand side well there are two possibilities it is R 1 is either 0 or 1 certainly if it applies if if R 1 is, is equal to this uh, quantity on the right hand side when R 1 is 0 then when it is equal to 1 it would not be equal. So, with probability at, at most a half it is going to be uh, equal that is where this half comes from and uh, the probabilities of the E i's uh, stay as is. So, we are going to uh, take the half outside and well what is this probability this is basically events that um, uh, span the entire uh, sample space. So, that is equal to uh, 1 ok which leaves us with uh, the probability of half. So, this is where how we get the, uh, the fact that this the probability of this bad event is at most uh, half R 1 uh, is the index number 1 right which is what we have taken 
it's, it was an arbitrary choice, but we just fixed, uh, assumed that there was some, it goes back to the fact that some entry in D was non-zero and we used that fact okay, to work with one entry in R. So, um, what we have shown is that delta, the uh, upper bound on the probability of the bad event uh, delta is, is a half. Is that good enough? Uh, certainly not. I mean, you wouldn't bet your life on something where uh, the probability of the bad event is uh, close to a half. So, how do we work with that? Uh, one thing that uh, we can take advantage of is the fact that um, this is a problem where we have an algorithm where it has one-sided error. Okay? When A, B is equal to C, we are always going to be correct. When A, B is not equal to C, we are going to be wrong with probability at most a half. So, uh, what we want to do now basically ensure that the probability of error is it comes down to some arbitrary delta star. So, you decide what the delta star is and the delta star could be like uh, uh, let us say 0 0.0001. Okay? You decide what that delta star is going to be. Now, what we are going to do is try to repeat this algorithm some k times and ensure that we bring down the probability of error to at most this delta star that your favorite delta star. So, uh, of course, this being the one side of the thing when a b is equal to c, we are always going to be correct. So, we are done with that. So, we are only going to worry about uh, uh, the case where a b is not equal to c. So, what is the uh, probability that this bad event d r equal to 0 is going to happen for all the k repetitions given that a b is not equal to c. Okay, that is the question and remember these repetitions are going to be independent repetitions. So, you can simply if they are independent you can just multiply them. So, it is going to be half raised to the power k and we want this half raised to the power k to, uh, to be bounded by delta star which means that you have to run this for k greater than or equal to log of 1 over delta star number of times. If we run it this many times and remember log of 1 over delta star is actually a fairly small quantity. It is uh, basically log is just a representation of the number of bits needed to represent um, a quantity. right? 1 over delta star could be something like if it is your delta star is say 0 0.001, your, your 1 over delta star is like 1000. Log of 1000 is what? Something like 10, like 1024, log of 1024 is 10. Right? So, that is all, if you just repeat it 10 times, you bring down the probability of error down to your favorite delta star. Okay? So, uh, putting things together, so how is uh, just to, this is the algorithm that we have uh, already uh, seen and we are just, we are just going to have to wrap it around the um, for loop and that is it. So, just uh, remind ourselves what the claim is. Our algorithm is always correct when a b equal to c. When a b is not equal to c, our algorithm will be correct with probability uh, at least 1 minus delta star. So, remember it is going to be incorrect with probability at most delta star. So, it is going to be correct with at least uh, 1 minus uh, delta star probability. And what is the running time? Well, we know that the original algorithm was n squared running time. We are wrapping it around a for loop that takes uh, log delta star number of uh, iterations and so it is n square log delta square. Now, one way to uh, think about this uh, delta star is you try to, you, you uh, we in computer science we are often interested in scalability. The larger the problem we want, uh, we want to ensure that our guarantees are strong. right? So, what we, let us say we want our delta star to be equal to 1 over n. Okay? And uh, when we get a correctness of this form where the incorrectness probability is at most 1 over n and therefore, the correctness is at least 1 minus 1 over n, we say that the algorithm is correct with high probability. This is a standard term used in these things. So, when we get the probability of correctness to be at least 1 minus 1 over n, it is correct with high probability. Okay? And uh, how do we ensure that we can get uh, uh, with high probability? And that is uh, that's easy, right. So, now uh, uh, 1 over delta star. So, uh, this running time if we want high probability, this running time will just become basically n squared log n. 
Okay. So, if you just add a factor of log n, you are going to get with high probability correctness. Okay. So, just we are down to the concluding uh, slide. So, uh, so what we saw, so let us just conclude our uh, segment. Uh, in the previous segment, we saw uh, the algorithm to verify uh, matrix multiplication. What we have done is carefully go through the analysis of this algorithm. We have shown that uh, uh, we have we've studied uh, principle of deferred decision, the law of total probability and we have shown that uh, uh, it is uh, correct with high probability. Okay. So, with that uh, let us look forward to the next segment, it is going to be another exciting algorithm called the uh, Karger's min cut algorithm.